community television, so uh, part of our role is to guide in the community, and today I'm very pleased to be sitting inside the Marion Institute, an institution in Marion that people may know, not know a lot about. So I've come in to talk to Deza here, Deza Van Larshoven, and uh, she's going to let us know what goes on here, and uh, we're going to talk specifically about the Bioneers Conference, which has uh, become uh, the regular part of the uh, annual calendar in New Bedford. So thanks for inviting me in. Of course, yeah. thanks for being here. Yeah, and for a nice cup of tea. That's right, of on course. On a day like this. <laughs> nice, and, nice and rainy out there. Yeah. All right, so, um, I mean, just to give people a general overview, I mean, can you tell us about the Marion Institute? Sure. Yeah. So the Marion Institute was created in 1993, and we are a nonprofit, and our tagline is Root Cause Solutions. So essentially, we have 20 programs and projects worldwide. Uh -huh. We try to identify a problem in, say, the education system or the medical um, the medical field, and then identify what a solution could be. So we have everything from a school in India and Nepal to uh, working with clinics, uh, biological medicine clinics in Arizona and, and Switzerland. So, and then of course what you talked about, which is our Connecting for Change by Years by the Bay Conference. Yep. And that is an annual conference that we've had. This will be our ninth year. Um, it's in October every single year. It's October 25th to the 27th. And it's really about bringing leaders, thought leaders, visionaries, solution-based leaders in uh, about 12 topic areas. Mm -hmm. So topic areas such as food and farming, health and healing, green business, indigenous knowledge, spirituality, women empowerment, youth leadership, um, and innovative and technology. So it's sort of a way to bring these people and then to, to bring these visionaries together but then bring all sorts of visionaries on the ground. You know, in, in, we had about 3,000 people come last year mm -hmm. to the conference between 2,500 and 3,000. And um, you know, we hope by putting them together that they will make some magic. They will create solutions. They will learn about other solutions on the ground. Yeah, right. And you pretty much take over downtown New Bedford. We pretty much yeah. do, yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a little bit you know, different this year because there's some construction happening with Custom House Square and all of that. So there's going to be some, some different feel. Uh -huh. And every year we try to get a little bit um, better and try to do a little bit more locally and support more local businesses and things like that. Yeah. And so, as you said, we have... We sort of sprawl out a little bit. We take over at the Zyterian Theater for three days, and outside that we have tents that are open to the public, so you don't have to have a ticket or anything to go in there. And we have a farmer's market and yeah. a little kid's station, so you can bring, you know, moms and dads can bring their five, seven, eight, ten-year-old uh, child. And then um, we, we have all sorts of arts and crafts. And again, it always is about sustainability and social justice, yeah. so we sort right. of have that bend on it. And uh, do the same people come every year? I mean, is, is it like a community thing? It is, yeah. yeah. It's uh, and you've been there, so we've, we've been yeah. able to grab you in there at times. But um, it's it's it is. It's like a, it's a little bit of like a family. It's so you kind of uh, what I've heard is it's sort of a place to, that you can refill your batteries. But we do always uh, push out push outwards. So mm -hmm. last year we had individuals coming from 27 states, which was our largest. I mean, you know, we we get better every year tracking things, but it yeah. was the largest amount. Um, we weren't expecting that many, uh, coming from that many states, but um, we really try to focus here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and try to bring as many people from, from here as possible. But yeah. amazingly, people, which we want to, you know, people from New York and Connecticut and Hampshire, Vermont, Maine come. Yeah. And, and it's just great because they're sort of leaders in their community and they share and just kind of get recharged and go back home mm. and hopefully act. So that's the whole reason that we're doing it is yeah. to, now, they have one on the West Coast, right? That's where it started. They do, yeah. yeah. That's the mothership. So that's actually in San Rafael, California. Yeah. And that's been going on for almost 25 years. And they, about a dozen years ago or so, figured out that they couldn't reach everybody. And so they, they coined the phrase satellite sites. So we are actually their largest satellite site. Oh, really? And there's 20 about 24 of them and probably going to be about 30 this year. And around the U.S.? Around the U.S. Oh, really? Around the U.S. and there's one actually in England um, now. And, and do so they all happen concurrently? Yeah. They they don't. Most of them, they used to, yeah. um, but they're starting to stagger them now. Um, so this year, uh, Big Bioneers in California, they're going to have theirs and then we'll be a week later. We've always been a week later in our yeah. area um, because we, we are... 
Kenny and Nina, the founders, have toted us as the gold standard of satellite sites. And so we didn't want to compete in any way. We want to just collaborate with them. And right. so we didn't want to, neither one of us wanted to hurt each other with pulling keynotes. So we were able to pull amazing keynotes like James Hansen, the leading climatologist in the United States, is coming to speak at our conference this year. And he's spoken at Bioneers in the past. And so there's certain speakers that are, you know, in demand. In demand. Yeah. And so we want yeah. to be able to, to share that and oh, collaborate yeah. right. in a deeper way. So they probably more or less get on a circuit then, right? Some of these speakers. Right? They do, yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, it's so different. I mean, 10 years ago, they weren't, there was no circuit. There was no yeah. sustainability circuit. I mean, really, Bioneers was one of the, if not the leading, you know, conference about sustainability and social justice. So they yeah. really, 25 years ago, started that conversation off. And so, you know, but now it's different. I mean, even from my tenure of, I mean, this will be my ninth conference running, and it, it, it is so different now. I mean, some of these, these keynotes are asking for a huge amount of honorarium, and we actually do not give honorariums for our keynotes. Oh, yeah. That's one of the most beautiful things that uh, they actually donate their time to come and speak. Uh, at our conference. And, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's one of our rules. Oh, I didn't know that. I assumed that they were, you know, making a good living. No, this, and, and unfortunately, we, of course, would like them to make a good living off yeah. of this, but we couldn't afford to put that conference on at the, the, the level we're able to, and they, because of the, their generosity and donating their time, yeah. and they make special circumstances, like some of them are getting paid from different, you know, they'll come here and they'll go to two other universities or something right, like that. Right, in the area while they're, while they're traveling, yeah. 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 I remember I interviewed uh, the Planet Walker. Oh, and he was John down, Francis. He was down in Woods Hole speaking to some scientists at the Woods Hole Institute. Yeah, yep. so, yep. uh, yeah. He's a great man, for sure. So what about a blunt question? How, how do you respond to people who dismiss this as uh, some kind of hippie fantasy type thing? You know? Yeah. You, um, you probably get that, right? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I do, I mean, I think what we've tended to, to start to do is to go towards the people that are the believers, that are, that, that's, that realize that we're all, we're one. We are connected. Mm -hmm. We are connected to each other. We're connected to the planet. We're connected to our actions and what we're doing. And so in the past, I think I would go more towards them and try to convince them and yeah. like, listen, believe me, you know, yeah. climate change is real. And I would, you know, try to give them all sorts of facts and statistics and, 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 and I've learned in my old age that really like doing this for you know nine or so years you start yeah. to come to a place that says there are so many believers out there that say I know that I'm connected to the planet and how do I the decisions that I'm making a lot of the decisions I'm part of the problem and not part of the solution and I want to be more towards part of the solution and so for me that's a perfect invitation to start to give to talk about what can you do in your life to yeah. be part of the solution and what do I do and I my team here, it, they're incredible in the way that they all walk their talk. So that's one of our rules at the Marion Institute is we work very hard to walk our talk. Right. And that's like the so little So you don't have people running out for the smoke, no? Huh? No, <laughs> thankfully we don't. <laughs> but no, but that's part of it, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's to be healthy, it's to, you know, do things like buy, go to thrift stores and buy your clothes there instead yeah. of going and spending so much money on X, which then creates a debt crisis in your own life. And then not only that, but you're hurting the planet by not reusing and, and being intelligent in that way, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's really modeling that behavior. We, we always say it here, like walk your talk, walk your, and we, we try to encourage each other, not like blame and shame, but yeah. say, how can I help you? And, 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 or admit to, to each other, like, I have a problem with whatever that yeah, problem yeah, is. Yeah. So it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And when you have a team, when you have people that are actually believe it with you and say, yeah. like, you know, all these little tiny things I believe add up. Some climatologists, some, some people don't necessarily agree with me on that. But I believe that we can, you know, if each of us took more action and, and looked at our own lives and changed our own paradigms, yeah. then we would, we would make a difference. But, I mean, if you look at something as simple as recycling, you know, look how far we've come as a, as a society with that compared mm -hmm. to, you know, when it started. Yeah, you know? for sure, for sure. I mean, we used to burn things in the back of the yard. Right? Absolutely. And then we used to dump them, yeah. you know. Yeah, And now they have transfer stations yep. instead of dumps. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they um, have waste energy plants and mm -hmm. all of that, so, Definitely. You know? And now there's actually products being upcycled. So it's like taking that next level of saying, so, you know, stony field yogurt, if you take all those cups and uh -huh. you send them back, you know, Whole Foods has it, Trader Joe's, like, you know, all these stores have these pickup stations that you just dump it in there. 
and then they make toothbrushes out of it. And then you send back the toothbrush and they turn it back into a, a cup. I mean, it's, it's oh, right? so they can actually go upcycling, which is, in, you know, creating a product that's not a one-time use thing. Uh -huh. That's a, you know, a toothbrush goes to a, you know, six-month use thing. Yeah. So you can actually, you know, create this cycle. Yeah. So it's, I get really excited when I think about, uh, about those connections and then getting better. Like our carpet here at the Marion Institute, there are these squares. It's interface carpet. And it's actually, it's rubber on the bottom and only the corners are adhesives. So you can actually just pick up one corner, like one square, if you spill, you know, spill something, you can't get the stain out, oh, yeah. and you can just replace that one square. Oh, okay. And the that's other clever. thing, yeah. it's really clever. And then the other thing that they do is when you're done with it, hopefully in 20, 30 years, it's a long time, hopefully you're keeping your carpet, but if, even if it's less than that, you can, you call the company and they come back and take it and they remake them. So they will re-dye it, they'll use, you know, they use natural dyes and things like that. They'll oh, yeah. reuse the rubber, so it's, it's actually upcycling. Really? That's amazing, yeah. So th that isn't widely known, I don't think. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And in the, this whole building itself, there's, um, you know, this is no VOC paint. We have soy insulation in well, there. Well, it's all organic compounds for the benefit of our viewers. Exactly. Right? Which are things that go into the atmosphere. Exactly. And, and help degrade the ozone, et yep. cetera, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so, and, and pretty much everything that you see, you know, is either this was scavenged from another office. You right. know, we built that shelf. Some A volunteer built that shelf over there with a... It's all local pine from Gurney Sawmill, so it's like we really try to walk our talk, even with all of our, you know, all the things that we we do in yeah. the office itself, and for many reasons. So. Uh, well, um, what about the history of the pioneers as a whole? Then you referred to these two people in California. Were they sitting around one day and decided this was? Do you, you know what happened? Yeah, so it's a it's a couple, uh, Nenny, uh, Nina Simons and Kenny Osbell. Yeah, and are they uh, old now? They're no, they're not. They're I mean, I, they're like super vibrant. I think they're um, in. I think she's Nina's probably in her late fifties, okay. and um, he's that's in his six. I know that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they're, and yeah, I think he's in his uh, his early sixties maybe. Um, yeah. And they are just incredible. So he actually owned uh, Seeds of Change and created this the seed company called Seeds of Change because he was starting to see 30 or so years ago the issues with GMO and Monsanto and some of the big conglomerates in terms of seeds, which yeah. is a really big issue now for farmers. And they, they you know are constantly looking at that, um, especially organic farmers. They're charging a lot for those seeds. They are charging a lot for the seeds. So he sold. And about the time he sold that company, they came up with this idea of what if we just did some sort of conference to bring together these innovators. So they felt like people were ta weren't talking to each other, yeah. that somebody was doing seed saving over here and somebody was helping solve you know Africa's issues with with water and some over, you know over there and some you know all these innovators were were not communicating with each other. And so they said, what if we basically had a conference that just had these people, and then we could watch yeah. them talk, and then they could have dialogue and build relationships. Well, it was very successful, and it really was one of a kind. And because when I talked about it earlier, like our subjects that we cover at the conference are food and farming, health and healing, green business, and so many more, they, you're finding some of the top people that are working in those silos that, not, that don't necessarily work with green business if you're food and farming. Right. And so they started to connect these different types of silos, which was very unique. Usually sustainability conferences and things like that. I mean, that, that was kind of a buzzword in the, you know, in the, in the, not that word wasn't a buzzword in the 70s, but it was different the way it was prefaced. And, and now what they did was just connect and break down all these barriers and these different, you know, uh, silos. Yeah. So they created this idea and it grew from, I think, like the first year was like maybe 100 people. And now it's, you know, I think it's like almost 4,000 people they have in California. And they literally go and they set up shop and they put all these tents up and thousands of people descend and get inspired and then walk away and go back to their own communities and, and act. Yeah. When they put all these tents up, is it just like some open space, some outdoor type thing? There? It is, oh, really? yeah. It's a, it's, well, it's the Marin Center, so there is a huge theater, which is, which is beautiful. Um, so they're... 
They're, yeah, but they're, they are actually located in San Rafael, I'm sorry, um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, yeah. So they're, um, they go into to California. California at that point, they had it in Santa Fe in the beginning, and then they moved it to California because they weren't gaining the ground that they needed, and the Californians were very open to sure. this idea. And then they really created this mecca of people, you know, literally descend upon the Bioneers Conference every year to oh, kind of get inspired and reinvigorated. Right. So, and was it Margie Baldwin that brought it here? It was, yeah, Margie and Michael Baldwin yeah. and um, and uh, Callum Grieve, who was the one that hired me. He was the former executive director, and that was he, he brought this baby to this area, and we first held it at Dar UMass Dartmouth. Yeah. And um, really outgrew the space within about four years. I started to realize, like, if we were we were maxing out the auditorium. And we were saying, what do we do next? Yeah. You know, and that's when that whole discussion came came about. With right. do we move to Boston? Do we move to Providence? Which we had polls in both places that if you move it to Boston, then it would be you know it'd be full in a second, sure. and, and then if you move it to Providence, it's closer to New York and Connecticut, and you'd get those audiences as well. So, yeah. and there was um, it was it was a big decision, you know, yeah. and it was really my first decision to make as executive director, like big decision that's going to affect the organization. So I was I lost a little bit of sleep that I'm sure time because yeah. like moving to New Bedford and saying, you know, I did have the support of the board; they were incredible, and really? they talked it through. Michael, Michael Baldwin, well, and the mayor of New Bedford was probably all for it, right? He really was. It, it, it was, 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 it was Scott, Scott, yeah, Scott Lang, and 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 Matt Matt Morrissey, Morrissey. really did a good job as well. I mean, they both were. Working it out with us as we went, and and saying like we really want you guys to be part sure. of this community, and and I think for Matt in particular and Scott, they both really thought and were speculating that this was going to be bigger in the future, yeah. that this was laying some important ground down by getting people like Van Jones and Majora Carter and Paul Hawken and you know all these you know Dr. Von Dineshiba in the community to see New Bedford and to yeah. get excited about our world here. Yeah. Right. And so I think they, they knew that this was going to be a bigger bigger yeah. issue. They could see that it was starting to... But New Bedford has a lot to offer, so I'm sure probably the people who came were more or less pleasantly surprised. It's very. And I remember the first year, this is where I was thinking maybe I would get fired, but I remember <laughs> there's was, there was been a few times. But now it can't be revealed. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember talking to some people on the phone and being like, New Bedford's safe. It's... It's a beautiful place. Trust me, you're gonna love it. Like you know, where we're you know like talking about the downtowns, you know, the city and all the amazing assets in the you know in the community. Yeah. And I'm, I kept saying like, no, don't believe everything you hear. Yeah. Like, yeah. please, like, come and see for yourself and witness it. And there were some people that didn't come because yeah. they were nervous. They yeah. were like, this this girl has no idea what she's talking about. Right. And they and the people that came, the when I realized that it was going to be okay, was listening to some, like just walking around and listening to people saying, I've never been to New Bedford, this place is gorgeous. And just those like murmurings and like they felt, you know, they were safe and they were part of the community. And yeah. I will say the New Bedford community in that, you know, really came out in, in a positive way and supported it. And, you know, and that was huge for me. It's just having the host city yeah. smile and be excited about this. And even though yeah. they were kind of looking at me one eye like, what are you doing? Which is still somewhat of the case. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Always trying to break that down. But what New Bedford has going for it, though, is that they're not blasé. I mean, if you went to Boston or Providence, it would just be you know the latest thing to come down the pike. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that was for me, and for Michael, and for the team when we were making that decision. It was we actually believed we could we could be part of the solution in 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 this area in the south coast yeah. that if we truly stayed in the south coast and we honored our roots that we could we could see some change happen and some positive you know energy you know just sort of start to flow sure yeah. so that for me was i knew it was going to be an uphill battle for funding for you know this isn't you know the the hottest spot in the world for funding right. but i it, it outweighed it by having the human capital and the human condition of people saying, we want you here, we're going to be in this with you, and we believe in positive energy, and we believe in sustainability. Yeah. And so that was, for me, what made the decision. Right. Now, this is a big event. It's like two days, three nights, right? It's Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's actually yeah fr Friday all day, Saturday all day, and then half day on Sunday. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So who coordinates that the program? 
Yeah. You do? Uh, no, no, it's a team. We right. definitely have a team. I have an I mean, incredible... It's quite, it's quite a feat, right, to, to put, put everything together. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a lot. Um, a couple years ago, we were able to figure out, well, we needed to... I was directing it and the executive director, and so we changed that about two two years ago. And so we have an incredible manager of the conference now. Her name is Brooke Sigurdsson, and she's incredible. Um, she's been working here now for about three, three and a half years. And um, this will be her first year leading the charge uh, with this conference. And she's just done an amazing job at the organization. Uh, and she's so rooted into the South Coast community that, you know, she eats, breathes, and believes in sustainability and, uh -huh. and art and... Um, did she grow up around here? She did. She grew up in Fairhaven. Uh, so that she, sounds like a Norwegian name. Yeah, she's a... Uh, uh, yep, and she, she's Portuguese as well and she um, she grew up in Fairhaven and she lives in New Bedford now and she's very invested in the uh -huh. community and uh, the work, it's great, but it's insane Lee, um, the amount of logistics that you have to create because yeah. we're creating a conference center in a place that there's no conference center so we take over the Zyterian, we're in the whaling museum we're in the national park we're in you know the, the ymca we're in the boys and girls clubs we're putting up students from the bronx and from you know all over new york city and connecticut and you know at the boys and girls clubs which we're doing the like logistically speaking only is huge and yeah, then on right. top of that we have a uh, you know approximately we have 50, over 50 workshops. We have, you know, 16 keynotes. We have, you know, so it's like all of those people have their own logistical needs that they need. So yeah. we have to get them here or we have to get them housing. And actually, I will say Marion has been, Marion and Mattapoisett, um, in some places in Wareham, they've been incredibly generous. Homeowners have let us use their homes to put up their to put up our keynotes and our workshop posts and things like that. So oh, we actually, right? yeah. yeah, it's so amazing. So we actually ha haven't had to pay much for even the lodging of yeah. these speakers. And the speakers love it because then they they get to know the community. Sure. And then they get to know people from the community and they they start to talk about all these, you know, pe they're, they're telling me about people in my own neighborhood and I'm like, I don't even know them. But oh, they're yeah. saying how wonderful we had a great breakfast. And oh, yeah, yeah. So it's cool. But you feed people too. We do, yeah. we do, and we last year we were able to um, source eighty-five percent of the lunch food and the um, yeah the lunch in particular uh, locally. So we work really hard to do that, which means that we need to work with CMAP, which is a really great organization that supports the local Southeastern Mass Agricultural Partnership. Exactly. You have to explain. Thank you. Right? Thank you. Sorry. All right. No problem. Uh -huh. And um, so they're a great organization and they really support the local farms and the local community yeah. in that way. And they've helped us for many years, since day one actually, to secure local food. So even when we were at UMass Dartmouth, we worked with Sodexo to create a partnership. They're the co company that provides the food services. They at the were. University. When oh, we okay. were there, they okay. have, it's since changed to Charkwells. Uh, but I guess they're actually more, from what I understand from our UMass partners, that they're even more uh, open to local food. Yeah. So they've done a significant amount of work on right. local food. And well, that's become a national trend, though, you know, the buy fresh, buy local. Yeah. So people are starting to really question where their food is coming from. Absolutely. Because there's a lot of health risks now. I mean, it's not just about organic versus, no. you know, chemicals. Mm -hmm. It's just about, you know, the sourcing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Yeah. And it was, it like... You know, nine years ago, doing that with Sodexo was foreign territory. And when we started to do it, we had uh, Sarah Kelly, who's at the Island Foundation now, but she was the executive director for, for CMAP. And she was really using this leverage card because we were going to be spending a significant amount of money at lunch to, to, to have this, you know, it was going to be a conference, you know, in the in the school itself. Yeah. And Sodexo, actually, the the director at the time, she was flown to Arizona to give a talk about doing this because this was like unheard of in the big, you know, the good big corporate yeah, right. uh, lunch rooms right. of like, well, what, how are you going right? yeah, yeah, and well, they were like, how did you do this and is, does this work? And I remember she came back and she, you know, she had all sorts of questions, but they were and they took the risk with us and they deserve a lot of credit for, for, for doing that. Uh -huh. Yeah, good. So, um, have you got a theme for this year's Bioneers? Is there any particular theme, or is it, there, there's a lot of different topics as usual? Yeah, it's always, yeah, yeah. different topics. Um, you know, we have some incredible keynotes already signed up. Um, Dr. James Hansen, who is literally the, the world's leading climatologist. He was the one that wrote the IPCC 
um, and won the Nobel uh, What's Report. What's the IPCC? I don't remember what it actually stands for, but it's the what they won the Nobel Peace Prize for the it's a climate change report. I see. So okay. it, it was a group of scientists that put this together, and he was the leading the, the leading climate uh, climate scientist, and he works for NASA. He's oh, okay. Uh, uh, incredible man and just really really very well spoken about climate change and very science based in his in his factual um, way and we have uh, Joan Gussow who is she's known for and been in the New York Times many many times but she's known as the matriarch to the local organic food movement and Michael Pollan and Barbara Kingsall where everybody gives her credit for really starting this buzzword and these you know this this movement about 30 years ago. Oh, really? She is wonderful. She's just, yeah, so I'm really excited. Where is she from? She, I believe she's in Vermont right, right now, where I feel like a lot of people like this are from, but I think right. she is actually in Vermont. Um, her book was, she just published another book with um, Chelsea Green Publishing, who's a part, partner of ours, and incredible work. And then we have uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, who it was, um, or is a neurosurgeon and he has been all over the news recently, but he wrote this incredible book on his journey. He was one of the only people that survived uh, this, this near-death experience. He had a situation where it was this really crazy type of, I believe it was meningitis, and he was in a coma for, se for seven days, and he wasn't supposed to make it. It was just not supposed to happen. I read his book, incredibly compelling, and really talking about near death and, and what he saw on, on the other side. Oh, really? um, just very, very interesting. And it was interesting because he is a neurosurgeon and he had always heard this on his table when people would tell, like say, you know, they come out of surgery and I need to tell you this um, story, like what happened to me? And he would always, you know, he was very factual and said, I can't, I can't, I don't, great. Thanks for Good the story. For you. Good yeah. for you, but I don't really believe it because the facts don't line up. So it was like you saw the golden tunnel and people beckoning into the it other was, side. It was. It's or? a lot, but kind of, but not really. I mean, he, it wasn't scary though. Well, there were parts that were. He said, oh, yeah. um, but it was more what he felt was this feeling of oneness, and this feeling that everything was really connected to each other, and that there was this feeling of unconditional love. He's like, I, you know, never. And he actually had a problem coping coming back. And after, you know, when he was all settled back into his body and everything like that, that it was hard for him to, you know, understand it. But it's a really incredible story and very compelling book. Um, right. And he had... What's and it, the name of the book? Do you know? Okay. It's called Proof of Heaven. Proof of Heaven? Yeah. Okay. And, and well, he... That's one people might want to check out. Yeah. 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 And he, uh, he's really good at telling the story, but he, he... What's interesting is that the doctors, he, because he's so factual and he never, like, everybody knew him in his old world yeah and he came back with this experience and wrote it all down and documented it before he even did any research so that it was very real and right. raw and so it's really interesting because doctors are the ones lining up to listen to it whereas hospice workers from what I've seen and gathered hospice workers are like oh yeah we totally believe and we've been there and done that because we walk people through death you know yeah, to that next plane and then some people come, you know, before they actually die, they tell us what they've been dreaming about, and they're so strikingly similar that how can we, you know, oh, really? not believe that? So it's, it's so really he had a whole psychic change, really, then. He really did, yeah. yeah, from what I gather. I didn't know him beforehand, right. and, you know, but anyway, so he's going to be a keynote um, this year, too. So, so I'm sure it's very reassuring for people to hear stuff like that. And this, I, mean, I think Is that the so. takeaway? I mean, I mean, for me... For what I'm trying to to get across is is that we don't know it all, yeah. and it's I think I think part of the problem of humanity is that we want to right, which you know it could be a good thing too, but and it's that we think we're the most important thing, so it's all about ourselves, but it's actually all of us, and that we're so deeply connected to the planet's health, and we're so deeply connected to our neighbor's health, so if. You're living in this incredible amount of wealth, but I'm poor and starving and dying. That you're really not healthy because I'm not healthy. Like there, there's, and I think it's I'm trying to in the organization, the Marion Institute is trying to get us to understand that we are connected, and I think this sort of reinforces that. But also that we don't know things, and we shouldn't necessarily think we do. Yeah. We should try to continue to try to self-grow and learn and build. And, and be open to, 
you know, potential. Yeah, well, there's an old man once told me, it's what you learn after you know it all that makes the difference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I certainly don't know even close to it all. So. Yeah. Well, do you think your message is getting out then? I mean, have you seen attendances rising over the years? Yeah. Yeah, it steadily rose. Last year was a little bit of a blip in the screen. Um, I think because there was a lot of energy, it was the week before the elections, and there, it, it didn't feel as, to me, it didn't feel as full. The numbers say a different story. Right. Our conference has been shifting a wee bit, too, to having a lot more open and accessible pieces. So there's a lot of, um, which is so great, a lot of energy that we don't even know who's there. You know, it's just kind of, it's all hands on deck. Just come, participate, yeah. get involved, because we really believe in breaking down barriers economic barriers, whatever those barriers are, we don't want that to stop you from coming and participating in the conference. So we've worked really, really hard for that. So we sort of lost track of how to even count those people. So uh, we don't we don't even know truly how many people came, but we have a lot of, um, and we know for sure 2,500 people were there because I have their names. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we know that. So you stay in touch with them, I suppose, right? Yeah, we yeah. try to. We have a yeah. really good, robust uh, email list that we do send, you know, send email updates and things like that, and then we send them a couple mailings out per year um, to them. And yeah, we try to keep engaged and try to give them new ideas and, and let them know what, what's coming down the pike, but also, you know, feed them yeah. action items that they can do and things like that. Right. Well, do you ever get discouraged? I mean, you know, if you travel around the world and you see the scale of the problems we face, environmental and poverty and disease and people, uh, you know, who have done, their minds aren't open to change, mm -hmm. and then, do, do you get discouraged at all? I have moments. Yeah. I do. I mean, I think for the most part, though, when I travel is when I get so fired up because I see that we define wealth in this country, in the United States, so different than other places, and maybe we just have to start to redefine it. Like, for me, wealth is good health. Mm -hmm having people that I love around me, being able to go to work and actually love my job. Like, to be able to, you know, make decisions on what I can eat and what I can't eat. Like, that's, that to me is wealth. It's about um, surrounding myself with positive energy and being able to, to, to surround myself with positive energy. And so, I think when I go to different countries, like when, when I went to Cambodia last year, I was amazed with the people that were the poorest, meaning economically poorest, actually ate significantly better than the wealthy people in Cambodia because they're eating all food that they're growing. They're not putting any kind of chemicals and, and pesticides on it. Mm -hmm. Their their skin glowed because they're eating good food. Oh, yeah. And you know, but but yet they're striving to eat McDonald's and the crap. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, you guys have it right. Yeah. You guys yeah. are actually the wealthy people here. Do you under, you know? And it's that's that's the frustrating part for me is how do and this is what you know my grandmother probably wanted to shake me at times being like trust me I've been down this road you you know don't make the same mistake kind of thing and so it's like how do we say without saying how to do it this is the mistakes that we created in our country and this is what we learned yeah maybe you should take that advice but do implement it the way you need to implement it that's right for you yeah um, so yeah, I mean, I, there's moments I get frustrated. I think I get more frustrated with people's boxed in vision that, that in, in the people that I come across that are just kind of like, I have it terrible and I'm looking at their house that they're living in and their car that they're driving. And I'm like, I just came from Cambodia and I'm seeing people that, you know, had limbs blown off from landmines and I'm sitting there and I'm like, really? You think you have, and it's like, it's a mind thing. Sure. It's in their mind, and so maybe they do have it a lot worse than that, you know, beautiful person with their limb blown off, mm -hmm. in, in a way, because they're trapped in their mind thinking they have it worse. Yeah, right. So that, to me, is more of the, what I get down about. Yeah. It's like, I just want people to, like, blow open their paradigms and realize that we are like, you know, in the United States, that there's a lot of, we're very fortunate. We're very, I'm very fortunate as a woman to be from the United States, to have, you know, and, and, you know, to, to be able to, my peers, the, the, the men that came, that, that I grew up with, they look at me as equal. I am equal to them. Yeah. And, and, you know, whereas, you know, maybe 
peer, women 30 years older than me didn't have that same circumstance, but I do, and I did. And, you know, all the guys that I grew up with were like, of course you're going to be doing what you're doing. We knew it in a second. Like, there was no doubt. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Never, never a doubt. Spo I mean, I remember sports. Like there, there would be guys watching us play sports. There would be females watching us play sports. We were like, you know, we. I learned how a lot of my management stuff. I learned playing sports. Thirty years ago, women weren't playing sports in the United States. Yeah. Like you know, like you know, they weren't. They were playing like intramurals and stuff like that. But they weren't playing sports. And so, my whole management, the my style was is based on being a team. Like on a team. So if I didn't have that circumstance, if I don't, and all these little girls that are growing up in places where they don't, they can't, they don't have that opportunity in different countries, that's a big deal. Sure. Yeah. Well, how did you get involved in this kind of work anyway? I mean, were your parents hippies or something like uh, that? <laughs> well, a little bit. <laughs> They're not now though. <laughs> they, um, yeah, they kind of were. Um, my I parents. I was. Yeah. No, <clears throat> they totally. I wish they were still. Yeah. <laughs> But no, they're, uh, they, they really did. They raised us intentionally with, one is with, with um, like having a little farm. So that was like, we, I grew up having responsibilities, knowing how to work, knowing how to take care of other creatures, yeah. organisms, and realizing how special those bonds are. Um, I grew up in an interracial family. So my two oldest siblings, one, uh, they're both from Korea, one is uh, African American and Korean, and the other one is 100% Korean. Yeah. So my vantage point in life was completely different than most people's, and you know, literally those are two of the most influential human beings in my entire existence, and that's who I am is who they are. So, um, you know, I've been very blessed with that, and then my parents also instilled in us, you know, hard work, but that you gotta give back. And, um, you know, so when I went to, you know, to college, I traveled, I, did, I went to, I studied abroad in Australia. I started to really get, getting to be aware of how advanced Australia was in the environmental arena, and we weren't. And I remember coming back home and being like, I really want to do environmental science work. Like, you know, I was a bio major. No, yeah. And what respect for the advanced? I mean, did anything stand out particular? Super, some small stuff, but like, one big thing is like having a car there was a huge luxury and they right. would look at us like I mean they would roll their eyes at me and be like you all have cars like that is the most ridiculous thing we could ever imagine and I, and I remember going into the, having conversations about just how ridiculous that was and nobody had ever told me that was ridiculous that was something I'd strove for right. like, to have a car when you're 18 yeah. years old 16 whatever yeah. and they that was one thing that they just, you know, didn't, it was like the dual flush toilets, you know, 12 years ago there. It was their idea of preserving land. It was their idea that, um, you know, they believed in climate change back then. I mean, it was like the ozone issues that they were having, um, the it's greenhouse like, gas emissions. So they were, they felt it. Yeah. Even, yeah. even, that, and they started to make good decisions around it and keeping wild spaces, keeping wild land. So... That was a big eye opener for me, um, and then so I started to switch. And I remember coming back to the United States and saying I was going to do something in this like sustainability and environmental realm. Yeah. And they were people were just even like people would just look at me and be like, "Well, so you just have to become an engineer." And I was like, "No, everybody should know about this, you know, yeah. the environmental impacts and things like that." So and then as every twenty-one year old. Uh, young person thinks uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do after I had this bio degree and you know could go on to school could continue you know with my schooling and but I really wanted to do something different I didn't want to take the same path I didn't want to go and get a job right out of college I didn't like all my friends were doing that and I no. just didn't want to do it so I ended up volunteering I did AmeriCorps um, National Community Civilian Corps which is NCCC for 10 months and then I did another. Um, what did you do? I was based in, uh, so the, there's bases all around the country. There's about six bases, I believe, now. And I was based in South Carolina, Charleston. Nice place to be based. And I was able to, what, what you do is you travel with like a team of anywhere between eight to 12 people for 10 months. And so I worked in Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, on an animal refuge. A place where we took care of animals right. and did all sorts of things like that and then I was in little Haiti uh, Miami Florida building houses for habitat for humanity for two months 
I was in uh, Tennessee working at boys and girls clubs for two months. I was in Pickens, South Carolina teaching school and actually um, building gardens back then oh, yeah. for school gardens um, for them. Uh, so, so it was incredibly hands-on. It was a whole different perspective that I could you know, realize that our country, like I was the Yankee, yeah. so I would go down there and they were like, oh, here's the Yankee, and they would totally just rib on me the whole time about it. But I also learned, I learned a different side of the United States, a different part of the United States that I really wasn't aware of. Sure. Yeah. So it was incredible. And then did that, did another AmeriCorps program called California Conservation Corps, worked literally in the mountains for, you know, 15 miles in backcountry, so we bathed in the stream, stream the whole nine yards incredible like just so mind-blowing and breathtaking the work that i was able to do and it was just it was total grunt work it was um, moving stones and clearing trail trails and creating you know water runways so it didn't erode the trails and things like that but wow was it oh so peaceful and it was yeah. simple it was like you so must have met some interesting people out there oh yeah big time yeah not your average worker, I don't think. No, I mean, I've worked with a lot of, uh, they were my guys, my boys, I would always call them, uh, a lot of, you know, from L.A., and they were actually a lot of ex-gang members. And so so we're around the campfire, and they're telling me stories of, like, the life that they led yeah. and in their former life. And it was, I mean, you know, of course, I, they'd always, they liked to make me cry because they'd like to tell these stories that were so riveting. And, of course, I would be bawling. But it was amazing, and I learned about gangs. I learned that, you know, a lot of the reason that they were doing that was that they needed a family unit. Sure, something and to belong to. Yeah. Totally. And it like it shifted my just my stereotypical view and that whole thing and it just turned it on its head. Yeah. And that's what I love. I just I like to be wrong. I like to kind of I don't know. Like it was amazing and they're still incredible pe people in my life. I mean, I still think about them a lot, and we keep in touch on Facebook and oh, yeah. that stuff. So. so there are some of the ones who are able to break out of that cycle, then. They are the lucky ones. Yeah. Yeah. It, and and you know, and that's the hard part. Is they also talk about that too. Like they're like, believe me, I'd love to keep in touch with some of those. Like they were my guys, you yeah. know. And like and now I can't because I'm the enemy because sure. I left. And yeah. it's like this really you know tough, sad situation. But many of them did, and, and um, one of them, our, my team leader, who my crew leader out there, actually, his his dream was to do the Peace Corps. He, this is a guy who had a bullet hole through him, like, I mean, you know, really in a, a hardcore person that just, you know, fought for his life. Yeah. And uh, I learned, you know, a couple of years ago that he was there. He was in Africa doing his dream. He really? got accepted to the Peace Corps and was doing it. So, so were your parents... Telling you, when are you going to get a real job during this period? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, they were, I will say they were really, they were really supportive. I think my parents, um, they always knew I had this, I was never going to be a normal person. Well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So they, I think they were, um, they were very supportive of it. Yeah. They were, I think they liked actually going and visiting me in California and Australia and on my travels and and seeing the world that I was, uh -huh. you know, a part of. Yeah. And uh, so they were very, they, I don't think they really ever asked me when it, when are you gonna, they never really put pressure on me about that, which is weird. Because I feel like, but it was great that they didn't because mm -hmm. it just allowed, I think I put more pressure on myself about like, oh my God, I had college loans, I had debt. Yeah. And that was started to weigh on me at some point. And I got a, you know, I got a real job and then I wasn't happy with, you know, my real job and um, was working in sort of the corporate world and, and found my passion in volunteering. So I was volunteering as, as I was working in the corporate world, paying off my debt, and then landed at this job. Okay, and the rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah, yeah there yeah. it is. <laughs> All right, well, so um, you probably want to encourage people from the Tri-Town area to visit Bioneers if they've never been there. For right? sure, yeah. for sure, yeah. And definitely um, our, our website is www connectingforchange.org. Yeah, we can put that on the screen. Oh, sweet. Perfect. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's October 25th to the 27th, uh, 2013 this year. So come on down. There's we're, we're, we're sending, you know, selling tickets early on. We're sending out the Save the Day card. We have our, you know, all sorts of the keynotes on the on our website right now. Yeah. But we're adding to it all the time. And so, yeah, I'd love to, yeah, right. to see more people over there. And then stop by the Marion Institute office, too. You know, I mean, we're, we're here. We're trying to, you know, contribute locally and doing yeah. all sorts of work. So. Right.
And if you stop here, you might as well come across the road and stop into RCTV too, because uh, we're trying to be part of the community too. That's so, great. thanks for the invite. Thank you. And a cup of tea. That's right. All right, Perfect. folks. We'll see you next time. This is RCTV. Thanks very much. Bye bye.